bits of a piece of paper away from the bed. So this, I have G-code that somebody wrote that is made for bed leveling, and what it'll do is start, it warms up is what it just did, and it then homes itself and puts itself at zero. And I'll adjust it so I can get the piece of paper underneath, and then with the adjustment knob in each corner, bring the bed up until the piece of paper just gets snagged by the nozzle. And it's a feel okay. thing. Yeah. That's fine. I'll hit this button. Okay, so you were spinning this dial with your hand. Yeah. I hit the button. It's going to go to the back corner now. Yeah, repeat the process. Yeah. It'll do it twice in each corner. Because once you adjust the back corner. Well, that was weird. That wasn't supposed to happen. <coughs> Just smack that. Uh, and I cannot remember which is which direction to this to this point, but these this is one of the things people the reviewers on the internet loved about this printer is these ginormously oversized uh, adjustment knobs. People would 3D print these giant adjustment knobs. And they just were like, oh, you guys want that? Here, we'll we'll give it to you. That's the thing about open. Yeah. I remember back in like 2006 when the cupcake CNC came out. And the first thing we printed was a knob that connected to the Z-axis rod so we could manually move it up and down. And I just remember that being the coolest thing. I was like, 3D printers are the real deal. <laughs> that was the thing that convinced me. I hope you don't mind. I'm just taking a little video of this yeah, of so that I can just post it on Slack or whatever, yeah. YouTube, and uh, this will help people with just that, as you said, kind of the learning curve of the leveling process. Yeah, it's just practice, and it is a feel thing, right? Just how much you need, how close this piece of paper needs to be. The problem is, is that I messed up a print the other day. I set up like a 12-hour print and went to work, and I came home, and it completely failed, probably like 15 minutes into me walking out the door. And all of the filament, instead of going onto the bed, kind of ended up curling up and went into the nozzle. And there's thermal insulating material that comes stock on it. It's just Kapton tape that they put on the hot end to keep the heat in right at the nozzle. And that filament that balled up ate it and ripped it off. And now that I don't have that thermal layer, I think it's, the material wants to keep curling. So the my leveling has been really finicky, but we'll see if we can get it going. So I now ordered, I understand why you were saying that it's important to wait for everything to heat up yeah. before you do this. Because I did, otherwise it'll warp a little, and that yeah. just the amount of warping that'll do throws everything off. I ordered a replacement, uh, like silicon heat sock, to replace that that Kapton tape that it ate. But on Amazon, it cost ten dollars to buy five of them instead of just being able to buy one. So for you guys, I've got spares. You might as well just throw it on as soon as you get it. It's better than the piece of tape. So you're repeating the process now. What's the goal? Well, if you adjust the front left, theoretically, you might end up that back right. You do these both, these all four times, or two times. You so you basically go around it once to try to get it all set, and then you just do it once, a, once more to kind of make sure yeah. that it's all... Okay. It really wasn't that far off. A couple of times ago, you bumped against that knob, so... So maybe it did get yeah. messed up, and we'll see. You got off maybe quarter inch. Well, it still feels fine. Now, this is the nice thing about this piece of G-code. It'll now print, and it's going to print a base layer. How thick is this paper? Does it matter? I just use standard copy paper. Okay, so it's like 20, 20 pound yeah. or whatever. All right. So now it's going to go and print a, a ginormous part just to let us level. And I just put this filament in, so it might take. Oh, a so it'll basically do one layer, uh, and it'll show you that. And we can live it's... adjust now that it's going. Right now, it is not wanting to extrude, which is not good. Yeah, it's not. If you hear this clicking, can you hear it really quick? You hear that dunk, dunk, dunk. Yeah, I can the hear that. The filament's not coming out, so it's the extruder motor kind of skipping steps because it can't quite get it out. Oh, that's my fault. What was uh, what was wrong with it? It wasn't all the way fed in. Let's pause. Here, I'll uh, get out of your way. Yeah. Let's see if it's probably live demos. <laughs> this extruder is frustrating to load in. 
Uh, did you cut like an angle on the tip of the filament? Yeah, that there it goes. There it goes. Oh, okay. So what you got to do is depress this, and that pushes the roller bearing out of the way. Oh. And you'll keep sliding this all the way up into the into the end. And you should slide it until it stops pretty much or you feel pressure. Yeah, and now I should be able to resume. I don't know. I never really pause prints. This printer, hypothetically, if you lose power, I don't know when they came up with this, but it's really cool. If you lose power, it'll store its most recent step. And you plug it back in and it goes, do you want to resume where you were? And you just go, yeah, sure. Oh, that's huge. Yeah, it's yeah, super right. cool. I mean, a tiny little power interruption could just kill a 40-minute print or something. Now, the Prusa fancy $900 printer added in the extra feature of as soon as it power is disconnected, it uses everything still stored in the power supply to lift the extruder head off of the part so you don't get all of the heat from the uh, extruder after it powers off. That's super uh, clever. That's One of those things where you're like, oh, y'all were thinking. All right, so now we're extruding. How can you tell it's extruding? Just because you actually see stuff. Yeah, and it's hard. I have this, this uh, cooling fan, this vent fan that wraps around the nozzle and puts cold air all the way around it. And you installed that yourself? Yeah, and I printed it on this machine too. But it makes it really hard to see the layers as they go. So you kind of have to just let it do its thing. Oh, that's what that gray disc is. Yeah. And you is that another Thingiverse part? Yeah. Th this is a really simple one, but there is a giant custom uh, nozzle that some guy designed. Same with the fang. The fang. It's, it's wild, and it takes a whole bunch of parts, but people swear by it that it's yeah, the I, most amazing thing. I, uh, like, designed my own version of that. But it's, yeah, you take off the whole black part and put in your own 3D printed duct fan that goes all the way around and it looks super stylish and cool. Here's, uh, I kind of like redid it. I bought two blower fans and uh -huh. then designed my own shroud. Yeah, some people say... It's like calibrated? Yeah, it's doing a first layer oh. to see if... Do you have, a, do you have a, like a design for that? Uh, it's specific to my printer because gotcha. my nozzle is like not straight down, so that's why I couldn't use the traditional fang. Mine's like five millimeter to the right. So or it looks like so that's actually really cool. Um, I'm gonna call does, it. Do you find that having that much air blowing onto it does anything bad to it? Uh, so you have to like retune your PID values to keep the temperature constant, but it helps a lot that with, with the quality of the good, print because. Early on, it was like pushing the plastic around instead of cooling and hardening. Uh -huh. So let's say like a, a 90 degree turn, it would be a really round turn instead of a sharp turn because it's still liquid. The plastic is still liquid when it comes out, so it drags it. So if you have that hard cooling fan, it cools it faster so you can get sharper turns and better quality. Gotcha. So but you have to tune it a little for whatever you're using the material or? Uh, so like, yeah, because you, you know what PID is, right? I don't. Okay. Yeah, that's, so that's a the thing. can of worms. Yeah. <laughs> That's definitely something to look into at some point, probably. But basically, it just regulates the temperature, like oscillations. Um, it's actually a super interesting thing to read about if you're. Remotely. What's it short for? Uh, so phase. proportional. Yep. Yeah. It just it's three different terms, so it's just like proportional, integral, and derivative. So it just does each of those terms to your current state to achieve the next one. So if you want to get yeah, no, I I think I can extrapolate from calculus. Basically, just proportional is just a direct proportion. Right. To get then the integral terms. is uh, what is it? So it's just different terms that like affect the behavior. It's, okay. It's used. In I think every, I understand a little bit at least. Yeah, it's used for everything. You can you can go to a coffee shop and you'll see like the red LEDs on the the temperature controller on the on their like giant water kettle. Those are PID temperature controllers. If you homebrew, that's what I use. Oh, so in my it's kind of a whole system. thing where once you know what PID is, you can see where it's used all yeah. over the place. Yeah. Exactly. Gotcha. It's, it's like daily self, temperature. You know, the segways was all kind of an achievement in how fast those processors could do PID at the time. Gotcha. That was kind of the like major invention. It looks like you printed this too. Yeah, oh gosh, I almost forgot. This is the number one part you print. This is the biggest design fault of the whole printer. <laughs> so this is the control box. It gets hot, right? All of the stepper motor controllers are in there. It gets hot. So there's a, a nice motor to vent out, but it's just a grill. And this is zero. So it comes down here and it goes to print and it extrudes little bits of filament and drops it right on top of that vent fan. <laughs> And just people were reporting that it just kept getting stuck in there, and that just right. gets real nasty. First thing you should print is this handy-dandy dealio. What's it called? 
if you just search Ender 3 vent cover, It'll be easy to find yeah. on Thingiverse? Yeah. Awesome. So you've got that, the vent cover, you've got the... So the thing that you printed for the nozzle to direct airflow, that was just a shape that you didn't add anything else, so you just added that part to it, right? Yeah, I mean, that was a part that somebody else designed. Let's see, it's still curling and being weird on me. So the fact that it's not adhering to the bed, it's, it's pretty close. I think we might be okay. This, well, this first layer, this, this part it just did, uh -huh. it's kind of sacrificial. They call this kind of the skirt. They draw around the part the first couple times to clear the extruder, give you the time to make adjustments like I just did, uh, make sure everything's looking okay. Yes. We'll see if it. So what it's covers. doing right now is fairly normal behavior. Well, it's not great, but for right now it's probably going to be okay. So I can actually pick up this skirt layer and just rip it, get it out of the way because it kind of messed up. Does having the heated bed help this part at all? Yeah, yeah. I mean, a part. This part is super narrow, and what it is, it's going to hang off the side here. You see how the filament comes down in this straight angle? Right. This is about six, this part's gonna st stretch out about six inches and hold this like this. Gotcha. Just, it sh I should have printed it earlier. I think it's the reason my big 12 hour print failed. So I'm gonna print this out. And but what because that it's does long, is just help kind of keep the filament yeah. from doing anything that would make it harder to extrude. Yeah, if it gets this tight angle, it can snap. It, gotcha. can, it can also just yank on this axis if you're not lucky, if you're unlucky. Uh, yeah, see, I'm probably too close to the bed on this first layer, but because it's been fighting me, I'm just going to deal with it. This this material is like designed for 3D printers. They call it Build Tech. So, and if it, if you mess up your build plate, you can get a new one. A lot of people replace it with glass right away. I was gonna away. say that's what I, I bought a glass one because I was yeah. reading on places where that was some advantages to that. Yeah. What's the advantage of glass? The base layer on glass is just flat glass, just perfect. But if you look on the base layer of these parts, yeah. it absorbs the texture of this build plate, okay. which the build plate. Is textured yeah, to hold yeah. on to it. Oh, nice. uh, yeah, I can see that. <clears throat> what a lot of people do with glass is they use cool. hairspray or just a regular school glue stick and just put that down. It'll stick to that glue stick. And then once it cools, it'll pop right off. The other nice thing about glass is it's like perfectly flat. Well, yeah. So I had gel combs for Agro's gels. I would like to have a perfectly smooth surface. Yes. Yeah. I've done 3D printers of them. It's slightly. Uh, Rough and that really affects how it comes yeah, out. Yeah, the, of the, the glass is beautiful. It comes out yeah. perfect. The metal bands have a tendency to have warps in them, so you can, yeah. you can see one of the perfectly smooth things. Yeah, that's, you, that's the you got like the, the fancy BL touch. Uh, that level, that, right? The BL touch, yeah, that's that's what the one I got. That, it was like 40 bucks or something. That was like hyper engineered for this purpose. Cool. So before, people were using like just little capacitive metal detecting uh -huh. devices and they're like pretty fuzzy they're like where does it go where, do, where does it install on the thing because i have no idea how to use it you'll probably have to print a bracket uh -huh. to go on the edge um, so it goes on here and then it just makes it's basically a lit thing that just makes yeah. it super easy to actually but i mean they were using these these just static metal detecting devices that yeah they're plus or minus a millimeter on a good day but right. this bl touch to put that device inside of a servo so the servo drives, and based on how much the, the servo resists the press, uh -huh. it figures out. So it's super accurate. Super precise, yeah. Um, do you know I where will, it hooks into for the power? It, I think it's actually a little bit of a struggle to install because this currently does not have any logic out here, right, to detect the right. bed. So you're going to have to run wires all the way through this sock down into here. And there should be just a header pin that's open for that. Okay, perfect. That's somebody's, what I was looking for. Is because somebody's done it before. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Maybe not the specific printer, but they have the process. It, will, it won't be too hard to figure out, but it helps just to have that basic. Well, it'll probably be like this, and then yeah. yeah. I mean, it is, there are open source electronics in here, so you know, Marlin is the firmware that all these 3D printers run that all the printers love, but they also just recently somebody's been working on. What is it? Marlin's the big one, so this one's Clipper, I guess is like a related fishing joke, I guess, that people are really into. And well, it's kind of like a yeah. 
uh, what, a naming scheme that they've picked up, and they just keep continuing yeah. that. Okay, kind of like uh, Apple does with their products yeah. at Microsoft. I mean, the the cool thing is, is that all of these printers at this point, the high end ones, the the you know, we have our uh, Lulzbot out there, the Cura, or the Ultimaker, the Prusa printers. They all run open source electronics. They all run the same firmware. The thing, you know, if you run into a weird slicing problem, it's universal to all of the printers. Yeah, that's huge. Yeah. Because then, yeah, once someone fixes that problem, then it fixes it for everybody. Yeah, I want all of the printers, your cheapo printers, your high-end printers. Yeah. Sounds like there's a vibrant community for it. Yeah. The I'm curious, is, is the Kira free software? Yeah. yeah. Nice. And they are very understanding of the hacker community. You go to download it, and it wants some data from you. Yeah. It wants to know what you're using it for, kind of wants your email address. But there's that checkbox of like, I'm not giving you any information. I'm just, so wait, I'm curious. Does that checkbox yeah. does that checkbox default to checked or unchecked? No, if you it says like, what are you going to use this for? And it's like, I'm a student. I'm a, a hobbyist. I'm a terrorist. Hmm. And I don't want to share information. Right. Those were like. Well, five I'm options. just saying like the the difference. I love having that the option, but I love the sites that be, by default say opt out of that stuff. Yeah. It's like they'll let you opt into it, but they know that well, most people aren't going to want to. I mean, Ultimaker is open source enough that you download. Cura is made by Ultimaker. It's made for the Ultimaker. 3D printers. Which is, uh, from what I understand, extremely Two, high quality. Super high quality, $2,000 plus. Right. But you get Kira and you go and add machine, you go to other machine, and the Ender 3 is one of them. Gotcha. It's the profiles there. It's kind of like Arduino does with its, uh, yeah. this picking up your model. Um, and it's open source to the point where Lowell's bot, you know, they, they make their own printers. They took, they just took their code off GitHub from, from Ultimaker. Uh -huh and turned it from a blue background to a green background, loaded their machine profiles, <laughs> added a couple of extra things in, and now it's Lulzbot, right. Kira. They made their own version. It's all the same, but... I like that they don't even try to hide it. Yeah. Oh, sorry. How long does it usually take to print something? Is it dependent on the size? Like, so for yeah. example, something small like this, how long does that take? So you've got this balance of like layer height to print quality, okay. where you can print super fine print layers of like 60 microns, 0.6 millimeters, tiny, 0.06 millimeters, tiny, tiny, and that part will take two hours, three hours. Or you can print at 0.2 millimeter layer height, it will take 20 minutes. Oh, cool. So this part's printing 0.2 millimeter layer height, it's going to take 45 minutes. Cool. Um, and it's just a which your prints affect anything? Yeah, so this runs at like 45 millimeters a second, 50 millimeters a second, but acceleration's kind of the bigger thing because it is not, you know, just a straight ramp up. When you're printing small parts like this, it never actually gets to running at 50 okay. millimeters a second because right. it needs to accelerate. So your acceleration rate is kind of more important. The printer I have in my classroom, you know, I teach middle school and I have 100 kids in and out of my room every day. I need to print a lot and fast. I changed up the 0.4 millimeter standard nozzle on my printer for a 0.8 millimeter nozzle, so I'm just like, just it's more like a glue gun at that point than it is. It's, <laughs> it's about quantity, not quality. So much. and it's a delta printer. So instead of being X, Y, and Z Cartesian cart coordinate, it has these three arms that are upright, and they're fast. I can run it at 150 millimeters a second. The prints don't look good, but I'm not a design firm. I'm a middle school classroom. They designed something on the computer that's a donut, like the kid just sent me today. It's going to print out and look like a donut, but it's not going to be great. But it'll take five minutes to print out my printer instead of 20 minutes on this one. Right. Which is a weird thing that schools have not gotten around to. I'm like the radical one in the 3D printing in the school world that's like, uh, we need to print bad parts fast. Everyone else is like, we need great printers. They're kids. They don't care. They really don't care that their part looks awesome. Hey, I got this. Five minutes ago, they were looking at a thing on their screen that they didn't even know how to use the tool 10 minutes ago, and now they're holding the thing in their hand. It looks good enough. It really is. Kids' well, attention when you're prototyping, span. Because I adding things and changing the design, and I really yeah. want cheap, fast, yeah. yeah, you know, not even very strong prints to measure things and, yeah. and, and make sure the tolerance is working. And the nozzles are yeah. cheap and easy to swap out. It's you know, it's just yeah. a heck. You know, these two wrenches will pop that off. Wow. Heat it up. One size nozzle or various size nozzles? 
So you can get up to like one millimeter yeah, nozzle it holes. Small. It ships with 0.4, yeah. they go down to 0.1. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. But the, the reality is if you go to up to like 0.1, the heating element in this, it won't heat quick enough to extrude at that level. My printer with the 0.8 barely keeps so it up. So they sell the 0.1 kind of as more of a demonstration that it could go down smaller, but it's not going to work. People so do, that you know that, people build with. like hotter hot ends that are, you know, oh, pumping gotcha. 30 watts oh, through okay. some heating element and just, just, there's a guy, these guys see me CNC, they, for Maker Faire, they built a two story 3D printer that took in pellets, ground them, fed him through this super hot extruder and was putting out like an inch thick bead and was printing trash cans in like 20 minutes. Wow. That's kind of neat. Yeah. It reminds me of a story that Cory Doctorow wrote about uh, a machine that would walk around, gather its own materials, chop them all up and then make other stuff yeah. from it. Yeah. And I think people died in the process of yeah. like falling into that machine, but yeah. it was still fun. I met Cory Doctorow well, twice. Me too. Yeah. Uh, where'd you meet him at? In college, he was our freshman year reading requirement. Okay. And he came and gave a lecture, and he, had, he gave a writing workshop. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I wasn't a writer, I was an engineering student, but I submitted yeah, yeah. writing to be in his writing workshop. I got in I think somehow. I heard about him blogging about that many years ago, yeah. about how he was doing a writing workshop with some people. Yeah. And it was super awesome. Which college was this at? That was at Drexel University. I, I think I remember reading that on Boing yeah. Boing. I was, I was miserable at my job working a, in IT under fluorescent lights, and that was, yeah. you know, reading Boing Boing and, and those updates was, was like my joy. And it was cool. I... I knew that he was like the Wired Magazine multi-tool reviewer, right? and he saw my, my multi-tool in my bag, and we sat and talked for like 20 minutes about multi-tools, which I felt <laughs> was pretty cool. Yeah, that's all right. Yeah, that, then beats, he was, that beats me. And then he was just at Flyleaf in Chapel Hill. Yeah, I was there. Yeah, I was there too. I, uh, the, my, the first time I met him, I, I had an iPod uh, Nano, like first or second generation. And I had put an EFF sticker on its dial pad, and it fit it perfectly. And he was so, he, he was, I asked him to sign the iPod because I was listening to all his podcasts on it. And he was so tickled by that, he took a picture about it and blogged it. But that's, your, your story's better. So, yeah. Oh, I know. But yeah, it's awesome. That's He's so, a very down to earth human. The first time he came to Splat Space was invited to be at his farm. Uh huh. John stayed up all night finishing our first pirate box while I cut the acrylic for the pirate box. We took the first 3D printer that was built in the triangle by an individual, and we took that, and on the pirate box was loaded all this public domain stuff about privacy and also all of his private domain works, and we did a little talk at the beginning that said, during his talk, this pirate box is running. And he's like, what's on it? I said, well, all your public domain work and also all this stuff about like Except the book he was touring. For. Except for the book he was touring. <laughs> right, right. That's that, very that considerate. Crass. He said, what book was oh that? God. And then we got our pirate box signed. Which is still here somewhere. Yeah. And we got my makeup box signed. That's and awesome. And also sat there and printed while he was talking. It was. And that's sad that I don't know where that pirate box When was, what, what, what year was this? It was a sad talk because he was talking about it. It was the second year. Oh, nice. Yeah. You've been huh? doing your first year as president, and I was doing PR, so that was what? So that dates it. So that was so probably what, like 2000, 2011? Uh, yeah, yeah I mean, I'm printing just like gray. Yeah, with this one, you have to yeah. switch back and forth. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Like, I painted that. that. Yeah, that's what I figured. Yeah. Because, you know, that would be too much of a ask for this machine. Really oh, God. You can that, pause that and, and, code was so bad. It's back swap to film and yeah, but, you know, this is, my printer is at home. Yeah. The pirate box is here. This is relatively easy. That's super cool. Fine. I wonder so how much that, your what know, you did know, there yeah. influenced his like future like stories in Walk Away yeah. and some oh, of that other stuff. Yeah. The gray is actually like if you want to paint well, stuff, well, gray well, we is a perfect color. You don't have to prime it or anything. You you took Peter's So by that point, he was already really well familiar with makerspaces. Well, because I just had other Oh, okay, gotcha. So it was really nothing new for you to be doing what you did. It was just kind of fun and clever. Logistics. Oh, okay. Okay. Well, all the same. Awesome. Um, that's really cool. The only thing that you should be aware of is getting into the Slack channel. Okay. We just started a Slack channel. Oh, okay. Kind of if you give me your email address, I can add you right now. Okay. Yeah. And what we're doing is basically for, for members to get access to all of the groups where we're, you know, talking shop about what's happening in the workshop versus you'll be able to access the public channel as, as a non-member.